Did you see any good movies the last couple uh, weeks or so? I remember the Dilch household was all abuzz with Frozen 2 for, uh, for quite a while. That was um, captivating. And, and then for those of us who are a little older, um, the Irishman and the two popes kind of got some attention. And then there was Echo in the Canyon that was... Anyway, we had some fun um, being entertained uh, with storytelling. And it's interesting to note, I don't know whether you have done this or not, and I don't want to ruin your enjoyment of films or books, but, you know, they really just follow one standard format. Uh, Don Miller writes about this in, in one of his books. He, he says, here is nearly every story you see or hear in a nutshell. A character who wants something encounters a problem before he can get it. At the peak of his challenge or despair, a guide steps into his life and gives him a plan and calls him to action. You can do it, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> right? And that, help, that action helps him to avoid failure and end up in success. That's really it, Miller writes. The structure of nearly every movie or good book. Now, you may be remembering some stories that end in somebody's death or not the love affair blossoming into marriage but in breaking apart. And those will probably be art films from France that did not have a very good box office. <laughs> if it had a good box office, it ended with success, the hero getting what you hoped the hero would get. You'll see this in Star Wars. you see this in The Hunger Games. Uh, you see it in Frozen. Character, challenge, guide, help, resolution. If you want to write a new story you need to consider three questions. Who's the hero and what does she want? Who or what is opposing the hero? And what will the hero's life look like if she does or does not reach her goal? Now, I know some of you are saying, thank you so much, Walt, for sharing this with us this morning because one of your 2020 resolutions was to write the next great American novel and now you know how to do it or the great new film of the next year. Those of you who are not doing that may be wondering, what is Dilch talking about? I'm talking about our lives of faith and how one particularly creative business person has very successfully become a consultant to many corporations about how to market who they are and what they provide through using a storyboard. This Don Miller is not a screenwriter. He's a marketing consultant. Wrote a book about this, which our bishop uh, came across and then uh, shared to clergy saying, you know, you all ought to be reading this. Now, I don't know how many of my peers actually did take Grant up on that, but I did. When Grant does something like that, I go, oh, all right. Because Grant is pretty sharp wise to listen to his advice. And so I read the book and I got our staff together and we met probably six or eight times going over this book and its implications to us as people of faith just in our own walks of pilgrimage. How do we fit into a storyboard? What's our story? How does it fit? And what's the church's story? And how might the church make sense of what people are going through in their lives and what the church has to offer people and how to help people accept what is being offered from the church if the church thinks of what it's doing more in this storyboard framework than not. 
So it, it led us to getting a, a new logo. The new logo came out of that. You'll see that in the narthex. It's on our bulletins, on the inserts, and a banner line that goes with it, setting a course for a better life. When we look at Scripture, we see a lot of people coming to encounter God. Sometimes for them it's their very first time or sometimes because of some great um, momentous thing that happened in their life, they're awakened anew to encountering God. And typically when that happens, they're having a feeling inside of, well, what's next? What, what do I do with this? What do we do now? You can think of this, the, the Samaritan woman at the well with Jesus, right? And, and uh, she has that encounter, and she, she wants everlasting, thirst-quenching water, right? How do I get this? How do I get this? The rich man wanting to inherit life abundant comes to talk to Jesus. Or the crowd at Pentecost hearing Peter preach about what's all gone on with Jesus' death and resurrection going, whoa, whoa. What happens now? What do we do? Peter, what do we do? We know from Wesley, when he got out of the pulpit in the Anglican Church and went out into the uh, fields and the coal mines and preached to people who were not very well welcomed into the established Church of England at the time, those folk had great excitement over the good news that they were hearing but they also had some deep trepidation because they kind of felt like, yikes, this is not me. What, what do I do? And you know what they did? They, they came up to Wesley and they hounded him and he started his spiritual growth groups. They hounded him by saying, how can I flee the wrath to come? So Wesley must have been kind of a fire and brimstone kind of preacher a little bit because he, he got the fear of God into their hearts a little bit, or at least the fear, fear of hell into their lives. I've yet to meet a parishioner that's come up to me and said, Walt, how do I flee the wrath to come? We typically don't use those words. We modern Methodists. Now, some of us might, and you just haven't talked to me about it. Um, you, might, you might think in devil terms. You might think in hell. You might think of a damnation. You might think that God came to judge and to punish. But, but most of us are not in that kind of mindset with our faith. We're thinking that God came to save and uplift and to forgive and to love We've had the experience of God's healing love in our lives, and because of that, we are people of love to others and back towards God. Our spiritual journey, I'm saying, more so we modern Methodists, our spiritual journey is characterized by the love of God rather than the fear of God. Is that pretty much your perspective? 1 Corinthians talks about how we're in this dynamic spasm in the world of going from old to new, of being reborn through God's love and grace, not through God's judgment and punishment. And so I got to be thinking about Miller's book and our 50th anniversary and our pilgrimages of faith. And it struck me that, yeah, I, you know, I think this guy is right. He's onto something here. We could, we, could, we could storyboard out our lives. We're our hero, and we could, we could line it right. And so I did that, and it came out of me very quickly. And it came out of me in first pass in the very traditional language of our faith, which is that we have a character, this human, who wants a holy and righteous life. This human wants to be saved. But he has a problem. He's sinful. He's dying. 
He meets a guide. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a, um, a neighbor. Maybe it's a pastor who leads him to the guide who is Jesus. And as he meets this guide, he hears a plan. And the plan is, in Wesley's language, the plan is to do no harm, to do all the good you can. You guys that went to the retreat, are you remembering this? And to love, and to love God, stay in love with God. Do no harm, do all the good you can. Stay in love with God. That's the plan. Believe in Jesus and be saved, the preacher says in the traditional language. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You will avoid the wrath to come. This is your ticket to escape hell, to escape damnation. And you'll end up in your later years in your rocking chair by the hearth, feeling at peace with the blessed assurance that you are on your way to heaven. Now, that's the traditional language of our faith in the storyboard seven-element thing that Miller does. And, and as I laid that out, and it came out so quickly, I thought, you know, I hardly ever say any of that. I use different words. I'm saying that, but I don't use those words. Why don't I use those words? And it, and it struck me that we're in, a, we're in a different cultural time, a different context, and certainly the people outside of our door, when they're thinking about God, when they're thinking about themselves as the heroes of their lives um, and what challenges they have, they're not saying, I need to flee the wrath of God. So I said, well, what do they say? What words do we use? See if these are words that you use. See if these are words that you think might be words that your neighbors would hear, that the person across the table from you at Starbucks might perk his ear up to rather than roll his eyes over. There's a character, the hero of our story. Who is this person? Well, it's a person that's seeking the spiritual being that he is. There's something more. I'm not really sure what it is, but there's something more that I want to uh, live into. And I, and I think that something more would bring with it a peace of mind. I'm, I'm seeking healthy relationships. I'm, I'm seeking a sense of meaning and purpose in my life. I'm seeking a sense of belonging and connection and community with people. I'm seeking having a sense that I'm doing some good rather than bad. These are all things I have heard of people saying what they are wanting in their lives. Have you heard them say this? They want to love and they want to be loved. And then if you've talked at any length or gotten to know the person a little bit more, you'll recognize the person will say, but you know what, I, I'm not getting much of this stuff. I'm not excelling towards these goals. And how come? Well, they won't say they're sinful, but what they might say is, I get in my way a lot. I'm, I'm kind of wrapped up in myself more. I'm selfish. I'm sorry, I'm probably just selfish. Sometimes I even sabotage myself. I don't know why I do that, but I, I choose the wrong thing. I consistently date the wrong people. I have good excuses for bad things sometimes, but not very good reasons for good things. You'll hear people talking like that, about their dilemma in life, that they're anxious, that they, that they feel alienated from other humans. You'll hear them say things about being anxious and, and worried and not being able to do things that change that. 
Sometimes they'll even say, you know, I'm just not good enough. I can never be good enough. And sometimes they're talking about living up to their dad's expectations. Sometimes they're talking about living up to a boss's judgment. But they have a sense of inadequacy. Yet they kind of recognize that they're agents of their lives. That if anyone's really living their life, it's them. And so they're res responsible for the mess as well as sometimes the good that's in there. And so this person has been talking to you at Starbucks and, or on the sideline of the soccer game and you've had different conversations over months and you've gotten a little closer, that person and you are having a little bit more um, candid sharing with one another. And this person will then kind of turn to you and say, well, you don't seem to be so bummed out about your life. What's going on with you? Or how is it that you lived through your mother's death so well? Or why do you sleep through the night? How come you always seem to have a positive frame, even though there's challenges, I know, in your life, right? And, and, and all of a sudden, you'll be invited into being a guide in this person's life. Now, it might be you because you're a neighbor or a good friend or because the person knows you from uh, some other kind of connection. Um, it may be that they've done that to me because they, they know I'm a clergy. Um, and so you say, a plan. But it's not like you're taking over their lives offering a plan. I don't say, well, you ought to do this, 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 and this. You basically say, well, this has worked for me. These kind of behaviors, these kind of activities have helped me live through that grief, helped me find new purpose, helped me heal relationships. And so you offer them the opportunity to connect with God in a fresh way for them, a way that they may feel pretty awkward about because they were alienated from church or they never were introduced to the faith. But you invite them to, to come and see. It's not your responsibility to heal the person. It's not your responsibility to be Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. He'll do his job. The Holy Spirit is active in the conversation. You're just, as Scripture says, on the mission of helping to spread God's reconciliation. You're Jesus' ambassador. Extending the hand to help them into the relationship. So we have a hero, we have a problem, we have a guide, we have a plan, and then the person comes to church and gets turned off because we're all crummy. Or perhaps the person comes to church and we're just the lovingest people in the world and they feel a sense of acceptance. Why are they accepting me so quickly, so candidly, so what feels authentically? And they come back because that's kind of a nice thing. And they come back and they, and they feel like they're not being judged. They feel like they're being welcomed in and accepted. And, and they uh, sense that your caring of them is, is kind of a genuine thing and that you are offering to be helpful if they need some help. And they, and they come to one of uh, Rachel's classes and she's not bullying them with ideas. Rather, she's helping them to think through what God might be stimulating in their life. And, and that's kind of exciting because they haven't had that thinking yet. And so good things start to happen and, and connect on top of itself. And the person then hears through your voice or through somebody else's voice, stop wasting your life on things that have no meaning and value. Before you die, learn how to live. And the person is on his or her way to a better life. 
Does that sound at all like a plausible storyline? And do those words, those characterizations of the different stages sound like you or like your neighbor? Does this, would you use some of those words? Would you feel comfortable having that kind of process unfold? Do you see that in your own life? Can you see that happening in other people's lives? Do you see how that isn't a batting over the head evangelism? But, it, but it's rather accepting a person where they are and loving them into their relationship with God, however they find their way and at their speed. It's trusting God to do God's stuff and just being, as Paul says, an, an enabler of that process. So we, we kind of liked our thinking on all of this, and so we, we made up something that is not, uh, Paul was reminding me, at 9 o'clock I told them it was on the website, but it's not there yet. Uh, but it will be soon, right, Paul? It will be there soon, and it goes like this. See if this doesn't grab together what I've just been saying and would, as someone Googles through and lands on the church's pages and hears Rachel and I say this, their ears would prick up and they would listen rather than rolling their eyes and leaving the site. Life is a journey. Sometimes it's too hard, though, with all the twists and turns, obstacles and rough places, and frankly, all the noise of modern life. The United Methodist Church Westlake Village is here to help to help you set your course for a better life, to help you manage the challenges of our world. Come check us out. Visit the campus. Meet some people. We're good folk here. Then explore the resources of our faith tradition, our worship, our study, our fellowship, our service opportunities, all geared to connect you to your truer self, through the love found in God and in community. Go at your own pace. Embrace your journey. You choose the speed. We'll cheer you on as you set a course for a better life. How's that sound to you? I would want this. I think we all want a better life. We want to get ourselves on a course. And as the new year starts, we're all given that opportunity, that fresh opportunity that comes at certain periods of time in the year. New Year's is one of them. To recalibrate, to set our course for a better life. I'm thinking that that's what people want who are outside of the church as well, a better life. And if there's some way that we can be of help to them as they set their course for a better life. That's what we want to do. That's our mission. So as we go into this uh, next stage of our anniversary celebration, we're going to be using this as a framework, the setting a course for a better life as our framework. We're going to be thinking about these different areas of ministry in light of ourselves. How is this helping me set a better course? What do I need to do in this area that would help speed me more readily on my way? And we're going to be asking ourselves, how do we as a collective body help that person who's seeking find a better life? Amen? Amen. Amen.